Hello, everybody. Welcome to our songwriter panel for the 25th annual Woody Guthrie Festival. And this is sort of the virtual side of things. And this will have a little bit of a life online afterwards. So feel free to uh, share it or enjoy it again or whenever it works for you. Um, I have a really great group of people here today to talk about songwriting and making music that matters. So I'll introduce everybody. Um, I'll start with Sunu. Sunu Kodam Tara is a professor at Southwestern Oklahoma State University and works with the Oklahoma Arts and Humanities Council, which is a sponsor of the festival. And Sunu has participated in our last two uh, songwriting panels that we've done and has been really a great addition and has all kinds of interesting perspectives on stuff that some of us take for granted. So welcome Sunu. Thank you. Um, next we have Eliza Gilkison who is just a fabulous singer songwriter and an old friend. Uh, someone I met back in the 70s, maybe the early 80s, somewhere back then, I, I found your Lisa Gilkison cassette you gave me <laughs> 100 years ago. <laughs> I was old then, too. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Lisa's been, Eliza's been writing amazing music and uh, just really doing an, an amazing job of expressing herself in her music for many years. And I'm really glad to have you with us today, Eliza. Thank you for doing this. Um, last but not least, the uh, how do I where where to begin with this man? David Amram is just uh, a giant of American music, music in general, and uh, another friend. I, I first met David in 1983 at the Lone Star Cafe when he was sitting in with another giant of American music, Steve Goodman. And then uh, we got to know each other better at Woody Fest, starting around 2007 when I finally showed up. And you'd already been there a couple years. But David, um, I don't even know how to start with your story. So I'll just direct people to your Wikipedia page, which will take some time for you to pour through. But I think it's worth <clears throat> worth hearing the David Amram story and you know a lot of people I know know your story from a lot of different angles which is really it just never ceases to amaze me how many angles there are <laughs> to the David Amram story it's sort of uh, six degrees of David Amram so uh, by the way I, I would note that David recently received his I don't know sixth or seventh honorary doctorate along with James Taylor from the New England Conservatory, which is, and Ella Jenkins also, great children's songwriter. Congratulations, David. Thank you. And uh, anyway, today we're gonna have a conversation about music and making music and having a life that points towards music and is inspired by that that music and I can't think of better people to have with me here so <clears throat> I'm going to start with you Eliza I want to just say that uh, to me you've been someone who's kind of mastered the form and the craft of songwriting over many years and have just put out a lot of great albums 20 24 albums I think I read <laughs> and um but your, the way I've sort of perceived you as a musician has been that you're really able to express kind of your inner and outer worlds in a way that's powerful and connects with people. And, you know, I think you're um, able to touch on, you know, and have insight into emotional and uh, you know, very personal issues and still be able to write songs that express great outrage at how our lives are being messed with in the world today. 
And there's a lot of interplay between that inner and outer world with your music. And I, I think that that's kind of what's always grabbed me about it. I know if I'm going to your show or sitting down with one of your records, it's kind of a journey. It takes me through a lot of, uh, you know, kind of emotional and, you know, insightful areas of, of my life that I can connect to your music. Does that resonate with you the way I described that or is that too complicated? I don't well, know. No, it's very complimentary. And, and I think it's accurate, certainly in terms of what I'm trying to do. <laughs> but I, you know, I was just thinking, um, Recently, the Folk Alliance wanted me to do a little one minute vignette uh, video um, saying just giving a tip about songwriting and um, and everybody had such great ideas as little songwriting, you know, fix, you know, little just little cool little ideas about um, songwriting that were sort of insider points of view. And and I thought about it. What is the big what's the single one minute tip that I that I would give songwriters? And my tip was live a, a meaningful life, live, mm. have a beautiful life, because I feel like um, th then you will always be, there will always be uh, something to write about, something mm. to be in a state of wonder about, something to be angry about. You'll have a, a, a relationship with everything that goes on around you. So I guess, you know, that, that has been my approach is first and foremost, I always wanted to have a, a meaningful life I, that was rich with <clears throat> experience and that, you know, that my my big goal was to never really shut down and to stay sentient and so that I could be informed by everything that was around me and that I could I could I could feel those things inside of me so that so that the writing would stay current and, and stay um, inspirational. So I, and I, I really admire writers that can just sit down, you know, and and write a story about something that's a third person and just you know out of their imagination and I have such respect for that and it hasn't been my experience I've really really had to draw on my own pursuit of, of meaning and and joy and um, and also my political um, leanings uh, my sense of justice so those things really figure into my my music um, there is a lot of emotion involved but it definitely comes from a personal experience so it's certainly not the only way to go about it. Um, there are a million angles, a million ways to go into uh, the, the songwriting space. But uh, for me, that, that living a meaningful life has really proven to uh, serve me well. Yeah. I mean, you made a record a couple of years ago, 2020, which mm -hmm. um, yeah. had a lot of political power to it, I felt a lot of sort of a rallying cry kind of record with yeah, a very with a was, very humanist kind of out, yeah out. it was certainly designed for the year 2020 i mean right. I, I had decided very last minute that i would make a record for 2020 because i had just put out another record so i had to and i was on the road with richard thompson so i was like i had to write a record really fast but um boy the songs really came and you know they I was informed by everything that was going on around us with this 2020 election coming up, and I, I knew it was going to be insane. So, um, yeah, it was it was good to write that record, and I, I did go from a lot of different angles on that one. Uh, some were just the heart, the grief, you know, of what we've been experiencing, and I I t often in my songwriter workshops, you know, we really talk about um, about processing grief and. Um, how to move it through the body and also to um, let it exist, so let, let it move through through you because you have every cause for grief right now. There's so much at stake. There's so much that we've lost, so much ground we've lost, so many, so much of nature that is at stake, and, and uh, we see it every day, those losses. So if you're, if you're sentient, you're going to feel grief, and so those things come up. But um, as well as anger, hope, all those things, yeah. uh, outrage, rallying, all those things come up, you know, um, when you're making a political record, <laughs> at least when, when I am. I can't, yeah. I don't write political music where I just kind of intellectually put together an, an, a political argument. I'm, I have to get in touch with what's really pissing mm. me off, you know, or yeah. what's really breaking my heart. 
and I have to go in and, and locate that feeling and, and pull a song out from there. Right. It works. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, 2020 had other ideas. The year was very unexpected and, um, you know, everybody kind of had to change our, we all had to change our view on yeah. our lives. And, yeah. and um, you know, your recent album, you have a new album that, a new record that I've been listening to that is terrific. And it's so much from a different place, you know, it, it really, uh, I actually, it's not political at all because yeah. I thought, you know, after 2020, I felt like we need to be in touch with everything that's of value and everything that's precious, everything that brings us joy. Um, yeah. And also, I'm, oh, I'm, this was a very reflective album because it dates back to um, a, a really early part of my life. And I think when you get older, you, you really do look back on different times of your life and, and people that were meaningful to you that are now gone. And there's a, a, a kind of a reflection that happens around that. And that, that was, this record was very much, uh, there was a great quote that I put on the record. It was um, one of the cowboy poets and I can't remember his name. Um, cry coyote, cry lonely till dawn for though, for, dreams unforgotten but gone for days unforgotten but gone cry coyote cry lonely at dawn for days unforgotten but gone and i think that really pulled it together you know at, there's a bitter sweetness when you look into your past um and people that are gone loved ones and just the time in, in your life when you, your whole world was um this flower strewn path <laughs> lying ahead of you and when you you look back it's it's very very it has a sweetness to it that has it's a it's a has a touch of sadness as well mm. yeah i mean the uh the, the the record's called songs from the river wind and it you know it um really kind of uh brings to mind the old west and um touches a certain place maybe a mythologized west you know but it feels right it's really a lovely record and well the west is just right on the edge of annihilation right now so yeah exactly look at salt us, lake the great yeah, salt lake is dry yes up. i heard about it. it's in the colorado yeah. I, I mean it's um and those of us who I, i've just spent my whole uh, childhood and and really right. my all my romp and roving years, I've just been moving around the West. I'm 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 in love with the West, you know. So, mm. um, so it it seemed right to make this whole thing be uh, somehow sort of an homage to our beautiful West part of the world, part of yeah. this country. Yeah, it's good stuff. Um, Sunu. Well, Hi. you know, I was um, earlier uh, gushing. Uh, over Eliza, because um, Eliza's um, song Requiem is mm, a song a, that yeah. it's one of those songs that just, as I told her, and, and I'm not like Eliza, I'm not even looking at you right now. Um, <laughs> because it's a song that uh, I describe it as a song that sits in my soul. Um, and it honestly, it, I, I because I know that it, it was written in uh, reaction to the tsunami that took place uh, from mm. the, uh, in the Indian Ocean. But for me, it, it was actually very different because I, I, had, uh, I just started, I was in graduate school and I was in a very dark place personally. And um, it was, it's a prayer for me that I just personally pray and I personally feel, and so, I, there are songs that everyone likes, songs that everyone loves, songs that everyone can relate to. But I wonder, and this goes for both of you, I wonder if the two of you have, and this is not one of those, what's your favorite song questions. I wonder if either of you or both of you have a song or a, a couple of songs that when you hear them, 
either musically or whether he, you, when you hear the lyrics that just reach you in that way, that no matter when you hear it or where you hear it, you have to just stop and listen to them and, and sit in that moment um, and, and, and just sort of feel that, that song. David, you, you, let's hear what you say. <laughs> well, first of all, I wanna thank both of you for being here. And I love the title, Music That Matters, mm -hmm. because that is what music is all about. Mm -hmm. And I'm someone who appreciates, I will repeat that verb, appreciates songwriters and those who can write as Shakespeare could write or Liza Gilkinson could write in 14 lines, a sonnet or a song, where everything is said right there. I can make up something for half an hour and people say, wow, but I've been doing that all my life. That's not songwriting. Mm -hmm. That's spontaneous one time only rapping, which is I'm proud to do and improvising, which I learned from a lifetime of playing jazz and accompanying Jack Kerouac and other poets. But when Jack himself actually wrote, and so many other writers I know, they didn't just sit down, get high, and scribble. They were not from the noted school of whatever. That's fine, too. And that's certainly, if people enjoy it, God bless them. But that's not being creative, necessarily. I suppose that's a way of starting, just like calisthenics before you do your magnificent job as a boxer, a baseball player, or a ballerina, depending what line of work you're calisthenicking for. But the end result has to be something that's beautiful. When I write a symphony, I'll sit there all day working on one measure. But what I get from playing with great songwriters and songwriters and musicians and people from all over the world, it builds up something in your DNA so that you're in the position of having to tell a story, whether it's in words or in music, you're able to do that. You have a second chance and your instincts tell you what is real and what is what's known in the vernacular as jive or the super vernacular jive ass, meaning you're permitted you have a constitutional right to use the eraser and the wastebasket and find a better choice. So out of the 14 choices that you have, your DNA, your central nervous system, your life experience that Lisa was talking about, Eliza was talking about, that's what enables you to determine what you should be doing. Lester Young, when he had a saxophone player say, Prez, let me play for you. And the plaster was falling off the ceiling as he played the flight of the Bumblebee box greatest hits and Arnold Schoenberg's greatest outtakes. When he was all done, Lester Young, the consummate gentleman said, that was most impressive. Now I'd like to hear your story. When I spoke to Kurt Vonnegut during George Plimpton's memorial and he knew I was writing a book, he said, David, you spent so much time hanging out with writers. My only advice to you is write the way you talk. Charles Chin, great Asian American banjo player, told me whatever we do, it should have a beginning, a middle, and an end. <laughs> Make it concise, put the same effort that you do when you're writing a symphony into what you're doing when you're playing when you're speaking, when you're writing. And also, you told me the Asian concept of osmosis. I said, what? He said, yes, we took the thousand year old egg, just maybe like a month. All the nutrients come into that egg. When we partake, we are nourished by those nutrients as a result of the osmosis of nether Mother Nature putting that into the egg. When we have our children, we take them to an art museum or a play or to hang out with some really good, warm, wonderful, supportive people, and it looks like they're not paying attention. We don't slap them and say, wow, wow, wow. We allow them because that's coming into them by osmosis. 
And when they grow older, they'll have that as part of their DNA. And that only applies to anyone who wants to be a poet, a songwriter, a singer, a bus driver, a brain surgeon, whatever. If you're with people, with circumstances, with the beauty that surrounds us, and you allow that to become part of you, that stays inside you. And when you have to make that choice of what to use and what to throw in the wastebasket, you were able to do that. I'm still never probably able to write a really wonderful song of all the songwriters I appreciate, but it enables me to appreciate them and to do everything else better. So when I go to a folk festival, people say, man, you were the uh, philomatic, you know, the music for man, sure, you can't, hey, you did this, you did that. I say, I'm not going there slumming because people use a capo and play three or four chords. I'm there to appreciate and absorb that beauty, that purity of intent, that exquisite choice of notes, the sincerity and the refinement to remind me of what I hope I can do someday. And at 91, I still feel that way. And I'm just grateful to be with all of you, grateful to be at Woody Fest. My God, talk about some talented people. Or when I go to the Kerrville Festival, any of those things, or what they call folk music, because everybody is folks, and we've all got music all over the world. To be with people who are that committed reminds me personally of what I would like to be someday, every minute, all the time. So I'm getting more out of it than anybody that I'm hanging out with. And I only want to say that for all of you who might be watching, who are told you have to network, there's everybody's and nobody's. Remember Hondo Crouch, mayor of Lukenbach, Texas, had a little sign, Lukenbach, population seven, everybody is somebody in Lukenbach. And that applies to the whole world. So as long as you stay in that University of Hangoutology as a lifetime scholarship student, you'll be cool. And if you're told, no offense, but you suck, uh, that's this is constitutional right to discourage you, but hang out with somebody else. <laughs> yeah, no yeah. shit. <laughs> yeah. No shit. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I'm, th I'm thinking in terms of, you know, well, David very modestly said, you know, he's in awe of songwriters, but I went, as soon as question was about, you know, who, what moves us, you know, and uh, and I find that sometimes it's not it's it's just the it's the sp spontaneous music of of that you know there's not particularly songwriter music is uh, sometimes that's that's my go to. <laughs> mm. So what David does, you know, is sometimes the thing that I'm looking for, and it it may be that um, you know we're so. We get so focused on the thing that we do that when we're, when we need to be moved and brought out of it, we, mm. we look to a different genre. Um, I mean, I've been la lately listening to an artist by the name of Garth Stevenson, has a record called Flying, and I am just completely <laughs> zoned out by this music. It's just cello with you know, movements moving through it, and um, it it just it really gets me and. I, I was thinking when sometimes when I listen to my own genre, um, I, th I start thinking too much. I start thinking production, and you know. So um, for for me to get away, I look for something that um, is not in my like. I I love, you know, music from other countries and languages that I don't can't understand. I I, I listen to Tanara Win, for instance. You know, and I don't even know. I think they're political, but it's you know it's Af it's West African, so. I don't know, but um, but I think every everybody has to find their way to be moved. When I listen to that music, I'm moved to write something in my vein. Mm. But I just think being moved is the whole point. <laughs> right. You know, what gets you into the place where you get sucked into the down the rabbit hole, you know, of inspiration. Um, you know, then you just keep it. I just wide open, you know, whatever that is. <laughs> for, yeah. so building on that for either of you, because both of you have, well, you know, have written or worked with artists who have 
either been um, challenged by the times who have been, um, or you have been challenged by the times or you have challenged the times yourselves uh, working with black artists, working with uh, people of color, any color race, or you have wanted to comment on the politics of the times, um, whether it's your record 2020 or whether you're working as a jazz artist um, or you're working with Jack Kerouac, who of course is this uh, poet who's going to comment on anything and everything. I. I just wonder, was there ever a moment or a time where you thought, I don't know if I should say anything, maybe I should back off, or maybe I shouldn't say this, maybe that's going too far? I, I would answer your question every day, because sometimes the best thing is to be silent. Mm. And very often, I found out the best example I had of that was when I was with Jimmy Cleveland in 1956 playing with Oscar Pettiford's band. And I was living in the Lower East Side and I was screaming the blues to this great trombone player who was probably only four years older than me, if that, but was about 200 years older in terms of his life experience compared to me as a 24-year-old whining hick coming to New York City and feeling neglected. And I was telling them my girlfriend didn't appreciate me because I had no future. No one wanted to hear symphony music with melody, harmony, counterpoint. The jazz French horn at that time was considered to be a non-instrument and that everything I was doing was a waste of time. Boo-hoo, whine, whine. And his response was, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Finally, he said, Dave, let me pull your coat to something. That was the slang for an English tailor pulling your coattails for the final fit to make sure that everything was correct. And in the, in the vernacular, pulling your coat, pulling your coat meant correcting you. He said, don't put your business in the street. Mm. And I realized less is not only more, sometimes it's very desirable. So when our farm burnt down, the New York Times expected me to whine and complain about the fire department. And I told her how lucky I was to be alive, that my wife was alive, my children were alive. I might be living over an auto body shop that I called the presidential suite, but I was writing a piece for James Galway and doing everything I dreamed of doing, and I was lucky to be alive. She looked very perplexed, and I said, well, if you want to hear someone sing the blues, buy a Bessie Smith record. And that ended the conversation. And I think essentially that we have to overcome our miseducation and learn to have respect for every single person that crosses our paths. And the chances are, if we do, they'll lay something on us, which is priceless, that they wouldn't bother to tell you not just about yourself, but about anything, because they figure, well, there's someone with what they used to call an attitude that thinks they're so brilliant. How could someone that they considered to be inferior to them possibly say something that was so obvious that they were doing, and myself included of the they, were doing wrong? That could be right. And at the same time, to see what the Native American people saw so long before we were lucky enough to come over here in boats at various times, the beauty that surrounds us, what the prayer of the Twelfth Night is the trail of beauty, all the beauty above us, below us, surround us, beneath us, and that we are there. And if we walk on that trail of beauty, chances are we can absorb some of that. And that's so different from the way we're brought up that you have to be the big shot, the smartest, the aggressor, the superman or superwoman, kill all the real estate and everything that grows on it, buy up everything, and then dump on the people who are working for a sub-zero scale to show who's the boss. That's the way, as a 91-year-old, I was part of that culture. I saw the same movies, heard the same radio shows, and saw the same sour sexually dysfunctional, nasty-ass people that everyone else did. I don't think I'm any better, 
than even Donald Trump. It's just I was fortunate enough to be with people that showed me that there was a different way to look at things, a different way to approach things, not to have an either or, to be on the side of humanity. And I honestly believe the younger generation is not against the other side. We're all on the same side. I think they are against extinction. And so are we all. Well, yeah. That's, well, that's, that's a great <laughs> overview. Beautifully. <laughs> that's Beautifully the overview. Burnt. I'm just yeah. thinking like just in the detail of your of your question, I, I, I something came to my mind that um, years ago I did a panel at Folk Alliance, and I can't even remember what the what the panel what the name of it was, but it was something political, and Billy Bragg and I and Rami uh, Assam and and somebody else were uh, on the panel, and a young woman of color um, said she, she asked me, um, what how do you feel uh, about um, white songwriters uh, telling um, our stories? And at the time, um, I th my answer to her was, um, you don't get hung up in that. Get, just write the best fucking story. Write your story, you know, and, and make that that's going to be more authentic than anything any other person is going to write. But, you know, I've thought about it for years, and I, and I really think, in reflection, I, I think folk music ha really started out as a white genre. We, ha we certainly had people of color in the genre, but it was very white-dominated. It was, co you know, co in colleges and... and um, and there was a lot of politics, and, and it was very good politics for the, the time. Um, but um, I, I, I think there is a changing of the guard, and I think it, it's a good idea right now to be really sensitive to that and to uh, really step back and let people of color take the stage now as, as songwriters. And I think we see this as happening at Folk Alliance and it's, I think it's just great. And I think Woody would have felt the same way. You know, he was telling the stories for a, a lot of, um, of marginalized people um, at, the, at a time when we weren't hearing their stories from them. We were, you know, we were, the folk singers really were, um, the bards, you know, that were telling those stories. But I think we have such diversity now and such opportunity for people to really take, for people of color to really take the, 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 the reins and run with this now. So mm -hmm. um, as I, I find that for myself, there are times when I, there's certain songs that I wrote back in the day that were from, you, you know, a, a Native American's point of view or whatever. I've, I'm very uncomfortable <laughs> with them now. And it's been an evolution for me, um, just feeling like, you know what, um, I, I just, I don't want to be that, there's plenty for me to write about right now that doesn't put me in that position where I'm, wow. I'm telling somebody else's story. So that it's a, just a sensitivity training, and I see it with my song, it, it has come up in my songwriting workshops, you know, where uh, someone is te telling that point of view, and I think there is a, a, a new found sensitivity that needs to really be that we need to humbly um, ad admit to and, and pay, att pay attention to now. Can I add something to that? I, I wrote a, a, a piece for the Philadelphia Orchestra called Trail of Beauty, which Eugene Ormandy conducted and Vine Deloria Jr. gave me some of the text. Oh, wonderful. So many other people, Floyd Ray Crow Wester, and people I played with for 40 years. But recently, about a week ago, I saw on YouTube, God bless the internet for that. Something done in Oklahoma, I'm sure you all know where Oklahoma is, unlike many people here who don't think everything west of New Jersey is have 40 million toothless morons that don't have any culture with nothing to offer until you get to Los Angeles. That's fine, that's part of our, your culture, merchandising, brainwashing, we all experience. However, in a place called Oklahoma, there's an arts council, and we have someone here who's part of that. They helped to produce something called Distant Thunder, 
which was amazing, amazing program done by Native American people. And one of the people who played a role in it, Matoka Little Eagle, who I've known and knew her dad, Swifty, way back 60 years ago, when she was born, I guess, uh, was in it and sent me. I don't remember the name of the person who wrote most of it, who wrote the music. It was incredible, so beautiful. And he had his own modern day music and traditional music, and he put it together from his life experience. And it was fantastic. And my first thought was, boy, I love the piece I did for the Philadelphia Orchestra. I'm really proud of it. But that was nothing compared to what this person did that was the real deal coming from him and his 50,000 years of presence on this continent's uh, feelings, which you can't. That doesn't mean we should back off. We have to remember Malcolm X said, white is a state of mind. Mm -hmm. James Baldwin said, we know everything about you, but you, you, you know nothing about us. So if people are upset that Yo-Yo Ma, who is not a member of the Bach family, can play those Bach cello suites magnificently, it's because he channels and devotes himself to that. And if Ramble and Jack Elliott from Manhattan Beach, Brooklyn, is Mr. Cowboyology, it's because he's devoted his whole life humbly trying to absorb that beauty, not coming slumming, not as an ethno-funkologist with a bottle of formaldehyde taking something into a prison where it can have a guard with a club to let you have one drop of misinformation if you pay enough tuition, but just someone who loves it and wants to share it, that there are people like that, and anybody can do just about anything. I saw Sister Rosetta Sharp the other night for the first time, a whole beautiful documentary where they showed her as a gospel singer, how much trouble she had when she was betraying what was then considered to be sinful to take the Lord's music into the public. And finally, at the end of her life, singing a gospel piece with everything she'd been through and how magnificent that was. And that if you're going to do music or any culture that you're not born into, you have respect for the people who are born into that you, you have what the Asian folks, what Charlie Chin told me, is a sense of face. You don't go up and say, rah, 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 rah. you could do that at home, but not with people from a different culture, because otherwise you're being rude. And second, and most important, you don't pretend to be them. You respect and honor them, but you understand there's a certain thing that people have a communal sense, a traditional sense, something I believe that you're born into it. Sociologists don't think, and cultural anthropologists don't think that, but people are that way. Uh, and if you have a sense of, of respect and, and face, you can be with other people. And I found after 20 years of playing with Asian musicians and African-American musicians and people from all over the world, people will come to me and they say, man, I want to hear some of your Jewish stuff. And at that point, if I sing or say Shalom or play something, I don't go into a big apologetic whine, 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 I wish I were you and not me. And I actually do that. I can see in their faces saying, oh, that guy digs his own culture that he was born into. Possibly he can appreciate something I'm born into and not just try to steal it and give a bad imitation of who I am. Mm -hmm. So when you get that respect, you can see every single person over here suffers from the same colonized mentality of I suck. But once you get over that and understand that the entire country is programmed into thinking that they suck, that they buy enough products to be less suckful than <laughs> might pass to being a groovy person. At that point, you really feel comfortable with, that, with all your fellow brainwashed immigrant, <laughs> who the hell am I, what do I go into? And you realize this so-called melting pot, God help us, that big corporate gruel of addictive, non-nutritious slop pit that we're supposed to go into ends up meaning 
that we're just undernourished, misinformed, and miserable and out of place. Whereas when you go to New Orleans, Dizzy Gillespie explained to me the concept of the gumbo. Everyone puts their precious ingredient of their life into that pot. When you partake of that pot, you are being nutrified by everybody's most beautiful experiences. And in Canada, they have what they call a mosaic rather than you're different, you inferior immigrants creep, get rid of that ethnic, which Floyd Red Crow Westerman told me is his code word among the Lakota people for subhuman. Rather than getting rid of that, you're told you have to declare allegiance to the queen, but if you're Canadian, you have to bring it from whence you came into Canada and every other Canadian will be able to appreciate what they don't know about through you. That's a whole different way of looking at stuff. And I honestly think with the YouTube and with the internet, with all the slop and slime that's on it, which is we've always been surrounded by, there's also those beautiful needles in the haystack where you can see and hear music, dancing, cooking, all kinds of beautiful things that we never would know about otherwise. And, and that's a wonderful thing. And the people like that being informed is taking the two space out of the two, no matter how horrible our politics become, and they've never been that great. The wonderful things that we have, if we lose them, they doesn't matter because they'll somehow come back. And if people know the difference and, and are not totally brainwashed, we're going to have a much better society than we dreamed of. And that's where folk music it's so valuable because that brings out this human story of people being together, building a community, saying what they know, what they feel, and wanting to share it with other people and not just making it into a total rip-off business of how much can I get these suckers to pay before I pack it in and become a real estate mogul. And I honestly think that most of the people who were in that corporate type scene when you watch them on television and they're making a whole lot of money, which God knows I'd love to do at 91, it's about time. <laughs> However, that's beside the point because the moments of beauty that you get are incalculable. And most of the people who are doing something where they know that it really does suck, truly, look miserable. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason for why they look miserable because they're doing something there being the tail wagged by a dog that eventually will find another tail and throw you in the slop pit. So I would just recommend for everyone, if you play the guitar, the banjo, if you like to play ball, gardening, you like to hang out with your friends, whatever you're doing that's on the human level, do that and feel good from that. You don't need a dope dealer. You don't need a guru who's defiling ancient sacred religions that they know nothing about, blaspheming, old cultures that they're not familiar with. And you don't need a used car salesman approach. And you don't have to be a get rich quick and leave town before you get caught criminal creep in order to be a meaningful person and have a happy life. And I think it's good for your health. So people say to me, man, how can you do all that stuff with your 91? You're supposed to be a grouchy old, etc." I say, man, desperation is very stimulating. <laughs> so I recommend everybody follow your heart, do what you feel is true, and try to get better. And you'll have a terrific life. And you never get there, but that's a good path to follow. I was gonna, I, and Barry, you got see, this is what I did last year, so you got to stop me at some point. But I, <laughs> I, I did write down this question, and it ties into. Um, what David was just talking about. I, I wrote down this question that I think ties into Eliza, your most recent album, um, because your most recent album, as you were talking about earlier, is about reflecting. And David was just talking about folk music and the power of humanity. And my question was, how can we use music to honor our perceived differences because we do come from you know different cultures and we do come from different backgrounds and languages and even 
religious beliefs. And a lot of times those differences are used to divide, right? Whether it's race or language or religion, and that's exactly, which is exactly what's happening right now. Yeah. And uh, it's all, which is, it's always been, it's the tale as old as time, right? How can music be the tool to do the very opposite? And how can, uh, and how do you think musicians and songwriters in particular be at the forefront of that? Do you want me to go first? Yes, please. Um, well, uh, when, you know, when, when you write a, a, a political record, you're you are going to take sides and you're, you know, you're going to lay out your points and you're going to lay out your emotions and everything. And I think that was one of the reasons I didn't want to make a political record. But I think that the old, the old storytelling paradigm is really the, um, the, the, the most universal way of tapping into the, the arch, archetypical stories that all humans uh, experience. And each artist has an opportunity to and a, and a certain angle on telling those archetypical stories with with their own characters and their own image imagery that's more personal but really what you want to do is tap into the these timeless stories and so um i think that was why i went with more of a storytelling approach for this record was i i wanted to find the things that we all experience and I think actually I, I try to do that with most of my songs even if they are political is, is find the the archetypical point if you get too specific then um, yeah. you can't tap into this you, you, you can't tap into the archetype anymore um, you you have to find just enough information to uh, in, excite the listeners imagination I mean once their imagination is hooked then you don't have to do all this heavy lifting in in songwriting you're you, what you what you're trying to do is just send out a, enough information for them to start a movie in their head with their mm -hmm. own information and i and with their own experiences and so if you if you give too much then they, then you're going to buck them off and if you don't give enough right. then they're you're not going to trigger their imagination so right. um i i really think that's for me that's what it, it comes down to it's to tap into something that we do know just um you know we we know from f from joseph campbell we know that there are archetypical stories we know that there are archetypes uh, and so w w with that much information we can take anything that happens and turn it into a, a universal story but you have to you have to craft it you know you've got you've got to really work on the, on the imagery really and mm -hmm. and uh and and the feeling behind it you, you've got to do a lot of of sweat equity to get there but um and a lot of it is editing i, I find this in my songwriter classes all the time huh. basically what i'm teaching is how to chop take stuff out mm. how to move pieces mm -hmm. around M most of the time they have a complete thing but they just need to edit things out like crazy and and put things in the proper order so that we we can follow um you, you know the whole point for me is don't buck them off and you've got to develop your awareness to be able to tell when you are bucking them off you know mm -hmm. you don't be so buzzing in yourself when you're presenting a song that that you're not paying attention to what where people are 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 losing it with with what you're writing you know you, you because you you want it, if you don't care that's one thing but if you care and you you want to move people and you want to move them down the road some from here to there then you you have and you care about that then you you've got to discipline and you've got to be able to do critique you got to be able to take critique you've got to be able to gauge when somebody's gotten bucked off, you know, you, you and and be able to have this dialogue with yourself. Okay, I lost him there, you know, or, and have two or three people that also give you information and say, you know what, that that line is not working, and you trust them, so you go, that line is out of here. You, you've got to be kind of ruthless once once it happens because you what you want is for is for to enter into the archetypical zone, and you don't want anything to cross their minds that's going to pull them out. From, mm. For three minutes, you, you've got everything has to be just right to get you from here to here yeah. and, and, and the, where you go somewhere together. Mm. 
great song. Nancy sang of, of, of the waltzing Matilda when the soldier finally comes back and he's lost his leg. That's one of the most incredibly moving, I, th I think, Andy War songs, unbelievable. Yeah. And I can imagine how long it must have taken the person to, to write that. But it, it, to me, that's one of the one of the great Andy War songs of all time. But it, it, just as Lisa said, it brings you in to the situation and is not lecturing you and there's not one wasted word. And that that's a, a great gift that I think that songwriters can have always done that and always will do that. And when the music business suddenly found out that what the military industrial complex there was also the anti-war industrial complex of those people who invaded progressive politics you might call it for 50 or 60 years and threw everything down the drain in order to get suburban kids to pretend that they were revolutionaries and and down the drain and handed the country over to the right wing where we're still not recovered yet that was something that we can learn from which is that you have a responsibility every time you open your mouth every time you go play music or do anything to be setting an example for other people of how you think it should be and how you're trying to be yourself so certainly and i'm sure lisa would agree because she's i've seen her perform a long time and it's always been a beautiful experience you have to have respect for those people with whom you are playing and you have to have respect for those people whom you are playing for mm. and the other way the adolf hitler donald trump approach which is to dump on everybody is very appealing to some people who were admired in sadism which usually comes from extreme impotence however with all respect for people who are like that there's another way of doing it which is be, would be considered to be humble or weak according to those who are often in charge of situations but that's the only way to go and whether you're conducting a symphony or leading a group with jimmy lafave whom we're doing a program for would have all of us get up there i said man he was beat Arturo Toscanini in the how to be a leader of everybody. He knew just what to do and to make everybody feel good. And when you understand that, you know when to stay out of the way, when to give respect. And if someone else is doing something terrific, appreciate that and them so that everyone else can appreciate it too. That's not the writing process, that's the performing process, but that's part of it if you're going out there and doing your own stuff. And some of the most amazing, to me, performers like Leonard Cohen, who just sat there and played a few chords and sang in one octave. My God, are those songs beautiful. When I was on a program and I realized I was being hired on the program to be the Mr. Constipation because I didn't was the first composer residence for harmonic and all that to complain. I said, he did more in one octave than most of us could do in a lifetime. Secondly, he was a magnificent poet. And third of all, the supposedly simple melodies, when you try to learn them and dare to sing them, are extremely sophisticated, very beautiful, and very memorable. So if you're asking me what is his category of music, I say his category is Leonard Cohen. Mm -hmm. And that proves yeah. both for Lisa and for the great Woody Guthrie, who we're honoring every year and for Jimmy Lafave who we're honoring and just so many of those people that come to Winfest are so extraordinary. Just to be with them is, is a whole lecture and a whole experience of how everybody really is or if not, they should fake it and try and become that way and they feel so good they would become that way <laughs> after a week of faking it and being that beautiful. They figure maybe that's the way I should go. And I think that's what to do it. We have to sort of somehow not let anybody know how we feel. And even the most vituperative, super colossal racist, Nazi fascist type person underneath all that has something human, which we all do, 
And we just have to tap into how they feel they're hurt and then somehow get them to feel what we're feeling and realize that we're more than a label and that you don't judge billions of people by their color, their race, their religion, their height, their sexual preference, any of that stuff. It's a soul to soul connection. And somehow I was with for 15 years, a great intellectual PhD scholar said, man, you hang out with so many morons. I said, what do you mean? She said, all oh, your friends, you're all are morons. I said, pardon me. I said, well, I don't think of people by their education, their pigmentation, their station, their location. I make more of a soul to soul connection with every person. She said, but you do that with everybody. And I said, well, what else is there? And I think that's all there is. Mm -hmm. It's musicians and people who can establish that. And rather than falling into the trap of, I am going to show you how to be a moral, spiritual, politically correct person. That sometimes can be perceived as being patronizing, to put it mildly. Mm -hmm. So you just gotta, you got to be cool, as they say in the vernacular. And I think more and more people are realizing that. I say in 200 years, everything will be cool, if we're lucky. <laughs> and in the meantime, we just got to keep on trucking and doing it anyway. Even if we're told by career counselors, you're losing ground by hanging out with those creeps and not doing this and that and the other thing. That's all fine. God bless people that are doing that. But there's another way to go. And I think those of us fortunate enough to come to Woody Fest or to do anything in our community or our family, because it all starts from there, somehow we're very fortunate. And once you see that, then you, then you get rid of a lot of the metal hangups and you can't really adjust to anything because there's nothing to adjust to. Just a lot of confusion and bad taste. And then there's always a simple, usually the most obvious thing is very obvious. And if you don't believe it, get a dog or a cat if you can't listen to your children. And they can tell you what's a drag and what's not because they feel it. Our DNAs all start out correct until they're poisoned. So you hang out with, you, with your kids and your grandkids. And if you live on a farm, as I did most of my life, that can help to cool you out too. Remember, I was playing after I was with some native folks in Alaska, they, they could actually speak to the birds. I said, wow. He said, look, man, you live on a farm and you go home, you have a telephone wire up there, try to sit, play to those birds. I said, okay, they were all doing that stuff. So I went home, beep, beep, beep. I was doing everything on my whistles. The birds were sitting up there looking and I could feel them. ESP, they're saying, is he kidding? And I realized, <laughs> They knew my language. I didn't know their language. <laughs> I had something to learn if I could get them to teach it or ever get to learn it. And, and that's, once you see that, then you're in that University of Hangoutology forever and you don't have time to cop a bad attitude because it's too, not enough time to waste. Phew. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I think it well, boils down to humility and respect. I, I'm going to take what David just said. Two words, humility and respect. Really? Mm -hmm. yeah. Really? Yeah. That are three words, what I tried to say in five minutes. That's why you're a great song. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you're an improv There's... guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, though. Boil down. Wow, well, <clears throat> we could do another segment and have another hour of this. That'd be easy, too, and fun. But I think we'll <laughs> bring it to a close. I want to thank all of you guys for being here. I, you all came voluntarily. I didn't need to subpoena any of you. I just mm -hmm. think that's generous. And yeah, really, there's so much experience here and thank you for sharing it and trying to get at that little and that little essence that makes the difference and when you feel that essence that essential 
stuff. That's where this art and this magic comes from and this music comes from. So I feel it and uh, want to thank you for sharing this stuff with me, with us, with all of us. Glad to be invited oh. on, on, on board and uh, thank you guys, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Sunu. Thank you, David. This was an honor. Thank you so much, both all of you. Thank you. I thank Sunu and Lisa and you too, Larry, for your time and all you've given, all the wonderful collections of, of witty stuff and things from all over the world that you share and let people have for free to take on tour, which is unheard of, I'm sure, in the, in the world. You do that without telling anybody. And the <laughs> Who's on your road for Okima and how much fun it is just to hang out with you. You are fun. Play with you. And <laughs> the fact that you somehow surpassed any expectations and just continue to be a warm, wonderful person. No, no, stop, David. Stop. <laughs> That's why you're healthy and still here. And you still here, alive. still alive. All those good vibes paid off because you, you're here. You're just healthier than ever. Grateful to be here, really. Okay, everybody. Love you. Love you guys. Love y'all. Thank See you. Okima. Okima. <laughs> See you in Okima. Have, have fun, y'all. <laughs>